uh, Dr. Marilyn Jenkins Medina, um, Curator Emerita of the Department of Islamic Art here at the Met. Um, she has been associated with the Metropolitan Museum of Art in one way or another for 50 years. It's impossible because she's only 52, but nonetheless. Um, and she has published, of course, extensively. She's published our collections extensively, and she's also written very interestingly on the collectors and uh, dealers who formed our collections. Uh, and so today, her uh, talk is uh, entitled Icons of Arab Art at the Met and their collectors. And I would say we are also going to move again. Um, part of this is here, and part of this will be in the next gallery. Um, uh, Lynn has really concentrated on Arab art uh, in much of her scholarship. And uh, so it gives us, a, you know, we have a predominantly Iranian collection, or at least 50% of it is Iranian. So it's very refreshing. Uh, to hear about our Arab holdings. And so, uh, with no further ado, I hand it over to you. Uh, the collection of Islamic art here at the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, has about 11,000 objects. And uh, probably a lot of you are aware of, uh, of the size of the collection. What you may not be aware of is that more than 60% of this collection uh, came to the Metropolitan Museum of Art before the Metropolitan Museum of Art had a collection, had a department of Islamic art. And the museum was founded, as, as, as has already been uh, mentioned today, in 1870. And we did not have a properly inaugurated Islamic art department until uh, 1932. And uh, what I'd like to talk about today are some of the things that um, that caused people to become interested in the field of Islamic art before there were any uh, uh, curators here. And also, uh, it's interesting to note, before there were any uh, universities or colleges in the United States that were teaching Islamic art. And <clears throat> one of the things that has already been mentioned, was mentioned this morning, that, um, that engendered a lot of interest in uh, the field is uh, the travel literature, which uh, started in Europe and by the 19th century was very important here in America. There were some of these travelers were artists who were going to the Middle East, coming back and uh, painting things that uh, that they had seen uh, in, in their travels. Uh, in the 18th century, the uh, uh, Alf Leila Wa Leila, the Thousand and One Nights, had been translated into French, which engendered uh, a great interest, and in the late 19th century, it was translated into English. <clears throat> so all of this really helped to spawn an interest in the field. Another uh, thing that has not been mentioned yet today, which created an interest in the Middle East, uh, were the world's fairs. And <clears throat> in uh, the period I'm talking about, uh, there were four in America. In 1876, uh, there was a World's Fair in Philadelphia. Uh, in 1893, there was uh, one in Chicago, which was celebrating the 400th anniversary of Columbus's discovery of America. In 1904, there was one in uh, St. Louis. And in 1926, <coughs> again, uh, in Philadelphia. So all of these uh, fairs uh, were uh, the setting for a number of Middle Eastern countries to uh, set up pavilions and to uh, really be able to create, for lack of a better word, sort of a Disneyland for people to come and see what the Middle East looked like when they couldn't go themselves. And uh, <clears throat> in Chicago, for example, they set up an entire street, Cairo, Cairo Street, mm -hmm. with shops, buildings, uh, cafes, and uh, they brought actual arch architectural elements to the fairs to make them very authentic. And all the pieces that were brought from these countries to the world's fairs didn't go back to the country of origin when the fairs were over. 
the vast majority of them found their way into private collections and to uh, museums. So this is another way that uh, the Islamic art, interest in Islamic art, uh, was spawned at this particular period of time. Since there were no curators uh, to help interest people in the field, collectors and uh, dealers were the ones who really served uh, this purpose. And I'd like to talk about two, de two collectors today and two dealers uh, that really helped to make our collection here at the Met what it is. Uh, it's the largest comprehensive collection of Islamic art in the entire world. And the first collector I would like to talk about is Edward Seymour. Edward Moore was born in 1827. He died in 1891. And when he died, he was the most famous silversmith in America and perhaps uh, in the world. He uh, was a New Yorker by birth. He learned his trade from his father. And <clears throat> in uh, 1851, shortly before his father uh, retired, Tiffany and company um, asked them to make silver work only for Tiffany. And they agreed to do this. And uh, after his father retired, um, by 1868, uh, Tiffany decided to buy them out. And uh, from then on, uh, they uh, uh, Edward Seymour was the head of the Silvers Department at Tiffany, and um, he was a member of the corporation. And he had 500 employees, and, took, and the shop took up an entire block on Prince Street. It's not surprising that uh, Edward Seymour collected Islamic metalwork. When the quest came to the museum, he gave the museum more than 2,000 objects, but f 422 of them were Islamic, and one quarter of those pieces were metalwork. And my favorite piece of metalwork, uh, of the medieval metalwork, is this beautiful um, candlestick base made in Mosul, uh, Iraq, in the middle of the 13th century. And it's not surprising that he picked the best, knowing what he knew about the craft. And it is, he loved the, the uh, inlays, and he used these pieces as patterns for his own work. He's left notebooks that said, bought for patterns. So we know that he was looking at this metalwork uh, for his own purposes. He had a flatware, uh, pattern called Persian. The Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, American Wing has a tea set called Persian. Mm -hmm. And uh, his favorite hollowware set uh, pattern was Saracenic. Now I have to mention uh, what is meant by Persian here, because uh, Persian was used really as Middle Eastern. Uh, uh, I remember working with uh, David Rockefeller uh, on publishing his Islamic collection, and he told me that his mother uh, and her friends each had rooms in their house that they called the Persian room. And the Persian room didn't just have Persian things in it, it had you know, Arab things, it had Turkish things, and it had Indian things. So when he had, when he called his, uh, his uh, T set Persian, he didn't necessarily mean Persian, he just meant, meant Middle Eastern. So uh, I, I want you to have a look at this. You have to look at it really carefully because it's so detailed. But we'll walk along here and um, other pieces that he gave that you'll pass by the basin here in the corner of the case. Um, this beautiful big, big tray uh, made in uh, Egypt in the 14th century with the beautiful uh, inscription going all the way around it. And we'll move into this gallery. He also uh, collected scientific instruments and the beautiful astrolabe uh, made in the Yemen 
here uh, it's dated 690 AH uh, or 1291 AD, um, uh, was, was one of his favorites. And the piece uh, behind Sheila here, <laughs> sorry, the, uh, this, this very beautiful brazier uh, made in Egypt in the 14th century, which was used for heating and for cooking. Um, in um, in a quite a, I'm sure quite a spectacular house, and the uh, it's inlaid with silver, and the uh, the uh, rings in the in the mouths of the lions on each side would have been used to put a stick through so you could carry the uh, the hot um, brazier from room to room if you wanted to. It's missing a, an interior. Um, um, part which would have held the coals and then the holes through the uh, intertwined dragons would have been used for spits for cooking. Now in addition to the beautiful metalwork, I told you that a quarter of all the pieces that he gave us uh, uh, were these beautiful uh, 12th to 14th century inlaid metal pieces. He also, uh, not surprisingly, liked glass. And uh, I want to point out a few of the pieces of uh, glass. He, uh, again, a quarter of the, uh, of the pieces that he gave us were Islamic glass pieces. And 10 of the most beautiful pieces of inlaid, of uh, enameled and gilded glass that has come down to us uh, are here uh, from Edward Seymour. And one of them, I'll just point it out so you don't have to get up. I'll come over here and show you this beautiful taza from the 13th century, uh, from 13th century Syria is uh, uh, a real treasure uh, and it inspired later on uh, the uh, Joseph uh, Brocard uh, in France to make a 19th century version of this. So Oriental, it, it led to Orientalism um, in glass, and I'm sure you're familiar with the brocard pieces that are in the shape of mosque lamps. Uh, there's uh, two mosque lamps in the case in the corner, also came from, uh, from Edward Seymour. So he was, uh, without the pieces that we've gotten from him, our collection would not be what it is today. I want to go back now and talk to you about the second collectors that I want to speak about today, and uh, they are the H.O. Ha uh, Havemeyers. Uh, Harry and Louisine Havemeyer must have known Edward Seymour because uh, when they got married in 1883, uh, Harry asked Edward Seymour to make a, to design a uh, flatware set for, uh, for his wife. And so they must have known each other. And um, I imagine, and so do other people, that he was very helpful in encouraging his passion on them because they started collecting Islamic art in a very big way around that time. Another inspiration for them uh, in collecting Islamic art uh, was a very important dealer at that time called Dikran Kalekian. And he encouraged them to buy Syrian pottery. And these beautiful Raqqa pieces, these three uh, vases from uh, late 12th, early 13th century uh, Syria on the Euphrates came from him. And the luster pieces in a, the large bowl and the taza and the uh, vase again also came from him. He uh, grew up in Kayseri, Turkey. He came to um, he came to America in uh, for the uh, Chicago World's Fair in 1893, and that is where we believe that they met each other. Uh, he uh, they met through their mutual friend, the artist Mary Kassan. and uh, Kalikian. Uh, they had a relationship, he had a relationship with the um, uh, Havemeyers for as long as both of them lived. The Havemeyers collected uh, Islamic art in a big way and the Metropolitan Museum of Art has received 560 pieces of Islamic art from them, decorative arts and carpets. But their uh, Syrian pieces are 
with, without peer, and our collection would not be what it is today without uh, the, uh, the generosity of, of the Havemeyers. Uh, <clears throat> now I'd like to turn to one final uh, dealer, and that is Hegop Kevorkian. And Hegop Kevorkian was a very important uh, dealer for uh, our collection. And in, in a way, he, he served a totally different, uh, he, he was important to us in a way that was totally different from the way that uh, Kalikian was. Kalikian really was a tastemaker and tried to interest his um, clients in the works that he wanted them to acquire, where uh, uh, Kevorkian was uh, someone who seemed to have a vision of things that he thought would be very important in time to come. And so even if he didn't have a client to sell them to immediately, he understood how important they would be uh, for the field and collected them anyway. Uh, he was an excavator. He, uh, as, as uh, Kalikian did, he wrote catalogs. They, these uh, dealers had uh, uh, exhibitions in museums. Um, Kalikian had an exhibition in the v and uh, in the Musée des Arts Décoratifs, and in the Metropolitan. And, and so they really served a purpose. They really served as curators when there were no curators to be found. So I'd like to just show you two things that came down to us from uh, Mr. Kevorkian. The square tile panel is the panel I'm going to, is the piece I'm going to talk about now. And this piece has not been part of the collection at the Met for too long. It came here in 2009, uh, but it uh, was bought by Mr. Kevorkian at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, most probably in Syria. And it was acquired uh, uh, here in New York, uh, and I'm quite familiar with it because it was bought by my husband. And we, <laughs> and we, uh, we gave it to the Metropolitan in 09. And it has, it, it, because it has such an interesting story and because Mr. Kevorkian is, is, is a big part of it, I just wanted to mention it. it when it was bought, half of it was on a board and the rest of it was in a box. And uh, when we put it all together, we realized that there was probably one box of tiles missing. Mm -hmm. And so we are hoping uh, that these uh, missing tiles might turn up now that it's been published and now it's on view and our conservation department has done such a beautiful job in reconstructing the, uh, the missing areas. And just before we finished construct, uh, getting it reconstructed, uh, we called the president of the Kevorkian Fund, Ralph Manassian, who's here today, and we asked him, is there any possibility there might be any pieces that have gotten misfiled somewhere? And he came up with two pieces, two tiny pieces. And so this small corner tile here and the border tile what he was able to find. And so I think they're out there somewhere. And uh, it would really be, it's, this piece was made for a, a, uh, a tomb complex in Damascus uh, around 1430. And it's a very beautiful piece. And if you ever see any pieces that look like this, <laughs> please let us know. <laughs> and there's just one more piece I want to show you which uh, you've all seen, and I don't think you're all going to be able to fit in, but uh, one of the largest and most important um, acquisitions to the Met um, in Arab art, and a real icon, is the uh, Damascus Room, which we got from uh, the uh, Kevorkian Foundation um, in, in 1970. And so there again, Mr. Kevorkian brought the, piece, brought the room back in 1934, from Syria, when it was given to us in 1970, it was stored in boxes under the West Side Highway. And we had to put it together. 
So uh, it's a real icon and it's a real tribute to Mr. Kevorkian that he uh, saw how important these things would be uh, for all of us uh, long after he was gone. Um, and if, when we go out, the last piece I wanted to just direct you to is a piece uh, that I didn't want to start with because it was at the very beginning, but um, Edward C. Moore gave us our beautiful uh, inlaid wooden doors, inlaid with ivory, and they're in the first gallery. So he, he, was, he collected everything, and uh, everything was of the highest quality. Now, are there any questions? You notice, and this didn't happen in your case only, we keep moving around to capture and regroup things that do make sense together. And you mentioned rightly that this very nice Yemeni astrolabe now is standing all by itself in a, in a uh, uh, vitrine, and right next to it is a copy of the Quran. What does the Quran have to do with the, with the astrolabe is another question. One in the other room, now if you walk back with me, I will show you in the other room, there is a nice 17th century astrolabe when they used in the old times to be put together in the same case so that people could actually see the development in astrolabe making from the 12th century to the 17th century. And that one here, next to it, is a 10th century manuscript about the constellations of Abd al-Rahman and Sufi, which makes some sense to put them together. But now that they are split apart by geography, what is the coherence of putting these things and separating them away from this? Now, who came up with this idea? I don't Can know. I? Uh, I'll take some of the blame for that. Um, the, the reason that the Safavid, the, the reason that the Safavid astrolabe is in that case, uh, is that it is part of a thematic case with other late materials such as coins, astrologically. Astrological coins of Jahangir. There is there is a descriptive label in that case that explains why those objects from different periods and places are placed together, and it has to do with the study of astronomy and astrology and their manifestations in different media uh, from the medieval to the later period um, in Islamic art. Why do we have a Quran there next to that uh, piece? Well, there isn't, a, it, we aren't making a point about the connection between the Quran and, and the astrolabe. And we, we brought out the plates of the astrolabe so that people who know nothing about astrolabes could at least see that there are more pieces than what meets the eye uh, when you are just looking at an astrolabe normally. I will not pursue this because I think at the very end of the day you might want to talk about this reorganization of this whole thing. Now, in that case, if you are really grouping the Safavid uh, case here with a thematic to say the study of astronomy and the astrology and all of that, may I ask please that you take this Yemeni astrolabe that fits perfectly, exactly, with the study of astronomy and astrology <laughs> and put him right there so that he doesn't feel lonely. All by <laughs> On the other hand, the brazier that Lynn was talking about is an object that was made for the Rasulids in Yemen. And the point, really, that we make in this gallery is the connection in the metalworking and um, uh, patronage of these very high quality objects by the Rasulid sultans in Yemen. And so there are different points we make with different objects and I understand your point completely especially you of all people the world's leading authority on astrolabes but um, that was what <laughs> <laughs> any, any questions about the collectors uh, yes can I just make a sort of a broader point that I think both your talk Lynn, and all the preceding ones including this morning have made is that um, the, although the Met collection and the exhibition of Byzantine art might epitomize developments that occurred in the, early, the late 19th and early 20th century, there were, there were other collectors, some of whom were involved with the Met, although they're not as prominent, say, as Morgan uh, or the Havemeyers, for instance, but who, you, and who used the same dealers. Kalikian especially, and Kevorkian. So really what we're, and so the collections I'm thinking of are, for instance, the Freer Gallery of Art, right. the Walters Art Museum. Henry Walters and J.P. Morgan and the Hathamires were all contemporaries and probably were sometimes even 
competing competitors for some of the same uh, the same acquisitions. But I think what's so fascinating, and I hope that all of you who've been involved with today's discussions will think about pulling it together in a kind of coherent, I don't know, a publication or some, something we can all benefit from. It's, it's really about the history of taste making and the kind of coming to understand the various levels and dimensions and dynamics of the Middle East and the Islamic world and all the different cultures and faiths that were part of that that occurred in the late 19th and early 20th century in this country, right. looking outwards. Mm -hmm. It's really fascinating, mm -hmm. and you've really given us so much um, appreciation of the, the personalities involved were really incredible, and they extended beyond New York. Well, I have a question yes. about that. Actually, just sort of jumping <laughs> off from that, because I was struck by the, because we've done, it's been very interesting to think about the connections between the market and museum collections, but I also wonder about the other facet that you brought up, which is the teaching of design, and how these things relate to what's happening, for instance, at the South Kensington Museum in London, and the creation of those big chromolithograph books of ornament, like right. Henry Shaw and Owen Jones and those things, because I think your, what your presentation did was, was brought up that facet very well. Well, one thing I didn't go into, and it's another whole big area is this whole Orientalism. And it's, it's such an interesting area. And uh, so many people were involved, of it, involved in it, in Europe, in America. I've even recently learned that they, that they were making uh, in, things inspired by Isnik pottery in Kyoto. So um, at, at around 1870, 1880. So this whole idea of Orientalism is, uh, which which I I did allude to with this the brocard glass, but uh, it it was it, it was very very rampant, and the same things that created the collecting were creating the Orientalism, and and so it's it's a very very interesting story. And, and it's a taste for ornament in general mm -hmm. as something that can then be applied practically. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and when Edward Seymour bequeathed this large collection to the Met, um, uh, he said that he wanted to make sure that it would be made available to the artists uh, to, uh, to be inspired the way he had been inspired uh, from these pieces. Can I just, just to add to that, yeah. and Henry Markham gave his bequest of, of wide-ranging ceramics. He said exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. He hoped it might serve to inspire yes. artists and artisans. Yes. I, just, I just wondered if you could say, given that we heard this morning a little bit about Morgan's love affair with Egypt, if you could say a word or two about Morgan as a collector of Islamic art. Um, I... Well, he, we had a mosque lab on view here. That's right. from Morgan, uh -huh. and we have a few, and the Morgan casket. Right, uh, the uh, the, the ivory, ivory ivory casket. But I don't think Islamic well, was really his main. Uh, yeah, there were some good choice objects from Morgan's collection that are in this department's collection. And in fact, when we opened these galleries in last November, we had an exhibition called "The Making of a Collection." and um, in that special exhibition room right there. And uh, we had this mosque lamp from Morgan, and there are a few other pieces, but uh, nothing like the numbers that came from um, uh, people like uh, Moore. Uh, well, the Havemeyers and, and Moore. So um, he spent so much time in Egypt. That yes, but that's, that's what mosque you lamp. Really thought of, told this morning, that this has something to do with and, his search for, for, for Christ. And also there are uh, textiles. Um, I mean, there, we have a lot of Coptic textiles. You know, it's sort of irrational that they're in both um, Helen's department and our department, and I suppose also Egyptian. But we do have um, a number of Coptic textiles and sort of early Islamic textiles that um, came from him as well, I believe. So, well, and, um, and of course, he collected cylinder seals, so the Middle yeah. East. But so it's totally different. It's ancient Near East, much more for yeah. Yeah. And, but no manuscripts because they're all Not in the here, library. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions? Thank you. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much.